Innocent Abroad, which was for me one of the great reads of that period in the Middle East. Impeccably researched, deeply personal and honest. It was not some typical Washington finger pointer or name builder, but a poignant must read for anyone who cares for something better in the region and the complexity of global diplomacy overall. No surprise, eight years in the making, his new The Master of the Game shows the same depth of analysis and cogent lessons about this very controversial and very important figure who's had so much weight on the world as it is today and frankly, Martin's world specifically. I thank some mutual friends like Herb Allen who then made us friends with Martin and perhaps much more importantly, made us friends with Gail. In the RSVPs I received nearly all noted not only their impact in the world, but their unlimited kindness. And that certainly has been our fortunate experience as well. And so David, I know you wanted to say a few words of greeting as well. I just want to join Chris in, in saying how happy I am to celebrate uh, this book uh, and, and Martin and Gail. Um, I first met Martin uh, when I returned from covering the Middle East in the early mid 1980s. I can remember sitting on the porch of a Georgetown uh, apartment talking to Martin. I liked him instantly, but more to the point, I saw him as somebody who had just a unique gift for understanding this part of the world. I've said, as others have, there's nobody who could have written this account of Henry Kissinger in the Middle East other than Martin. Uh, and it's just a, such a pleasure to be with Martin and Gail. And I look forward to the conversation. Martin, let me just kick off with a couple of questions about the writing of the book itself. And I'm going to turn then to David to ask some questions about some of the substance about it. But I was very, very struck. I thought back about our friend, uh, Rick Atkinson, who once told me that at some point he stopped interviewing World War II veterans because frankly, in that magisterial work that he did on the war, um, their memories just weren't good enough. They just couldn't really coincide with the power of what was in the record at the time. And I wonder, can you tell us how did you balance this risk in interviewing particularly Kissinger himself and others you know, with faulty memory, but also possibly the desire to rewrite history as well? Well, thank you very much, Chris and, and, and David uh, for hosting this. And thank you to everybody that's appearing on the screen. It's wonderful to see you all. I was saying to Chris earlier as we were, were waiting to start that uh, this pandemic era is particularly challenging for book talks uh, because you don't get to engage with your audience. You just get to talk to them over a screen. You don't normally get to see them and they don't normally get to ask questions either. So it's, it's, a, it's really, um, wonderful to have the opportunity both to see you and, and to have a chance to talk with you about, about this book. Uh, Chris, the, the advantage I had was, was basically uh, fourfold, if I could say that. First of all, there's Kissinger himself, uh, who at 98 still remembers uh, many of the details. Uh, and there were times in which I was just amazed that the way he would correct me uh, about, you know, that happened on Wednesday morning instead of Tuesday night. We're talking about the, the days of, of the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And 98-year-old, uh, to be able to remember those kinds of details is quite extraordinary. But he doesn't remember everything for sure. And he um, remembers some things, uh, let's say, conveniently. Um, he, of course, has written a three-volume memoir about his time in government. And a lot of the details uh, that he's put there uh, are uh, accurate. Uh, and I can say that because uh, he, as a man of history and a student of history, he made sure to document every conversation he had. Gail is, is here. Gail was one of his secretaries in those days who had to write out longhand, transcribe long, longhand his phone calls. All those transcripts are available. Uh, all of his uh, engagements with foreign leaders in the Middle East uh, are there verbatim so that uh, I didn't have to rely on his uh, memory for almost all of, uh, of what, what happened. Uh, on top of that, the Israeli archives are open so for that period, and, and that's a, a unique source for kind of comparing the, the, the Israeli version of events versus his version of event, uh, events. Fortunately, the Arab 
archives to the extent they exist are not open. So there was a bit of a bias there in terms of, of uh, documentation. Uh, the uh, other thing is that I uh, had my own experience to draw on uh, with uh, some of the leaders like Yitzhak Rabin and Hafez al-Assad and King Hussein of Jordan. Uh, that I'd spent many hours with myself so that I was able to, to I think, uh, draw on that. And, and uh, that, that triangulation was, I think, uh, a way in which I, I felt I could uh, get an accurate account. Now, having said all of that, um, one early part in the book, I uh, used the documentation to show that Kissinger actually had an opportunity uh, to head off the 1973 war. The uh, Egyptian National Security Advisor, Hafez Ismail, was sent by Sadat in February of 1973 to uh, meet with Kissinger and make a kind of far-reaching peace initiative that Kissinger at the time was quite excited about. Uh, but when uh, Rabin, who was ambas Israel's ambassador in Washington, and, and then Golda Meir, who was then prime minister, uh, got hold of this initiative and dismissed it and said, there's nothing here. Kissinger just backed off. His account in his memoirs is a very different version of that. He basically says that Hafez Ismail came with nothing and, and there was nothing there to be done. It's clearly was not an accurate recollection uh, of what, what actually happened. So the documentation is really the, the lodestar when it came to writing this book. And it enabled me to really take the people into the rooms uh, where the negotiations took place, rooms which I had been in on multiple occasions, same rooms, but with different actors in most cases. And, and with the dialogue that is recorded in those documents, I could recreate uh, for people, what it's actually like, what diplomacy is about, when you've got these these Arab and Israeli leaders uh, sitting down and arguing with Henry Kissinger. You knew the story so well going into this. You lived the ramifications of it. Did you have many surprises when you dug in? Yeah, um, several. Um, one that I just detailed to you. Um, the 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 biggest surprise, I think, was that. I thought I was writing a book about how Kissinger made peace in the Middle East. And in a sense, that is that turned out to be true. But in another sense, I discovered that Kissinger really wasn't pursuing peace in the Middle East. He was pursuing order. And uh, peace for him was a problem, not a solution. He thought that the uh, pursuit of peace with too much energy and, and, and passion would actually achieve the opposite, would destabilize the order that he was trying to create. And that wasn't at all obvious, certainly wasn't obvious from his memoirs or anything that he said to me. But I kept on coming across these dialogues that he would have with, with Rabin and with uh, uh, Sadat and with Assad, even Assad, the Syrian leader, uh, in which uh, they would talk about making peace, about taking the big step, about being willing to, to go the extra mile. Uh, Sadat in particular was quite visionary about it. And Kissinger was always saying, you know, slow down. That's really not possible. It's really not worth having. It's just a piece of paper. Uh, he, he was highly skeptical of peace and much more skeptical than the people he was dealing with. Uh, that was partly a product of his own experience as, as a German Jew fleeing Nazi Nazism in Germany and, and the chaos of, of uh, that and the Second World War that he experienced and the appeasement that brought on the Second World War. Uh, but it was partly also his study of history. And indeed, it was only when I kind of uh, saw these these exchanges that I went back and and started to look more closely at the first book he had written, which was um, his doctoral dissertation, the first book he published. It was titled 
A World Restored, Metternich, Castlereagh, and the Problems of Peace. So there it was right in the headline, the problems of peace. And lo and behold, there on the first page, he explains just what I, I said about how the pursuit of peace, the paradox of peace, he called it, the pursuit of peace can achieve its opposite. So his whole approach to peacemaking was all, all about trying to ensure a stable order in a very unstable and volatile region and using the peace process for that purpose, rather than trying to end conflicts in the Middle East, which was precisely the kind of thing that uh, all the people who came after Kissinger, including myself, tried to do. And, and in many cases, including the ones I was involved in, it ended in disaster. Kissinger was actually right that the pursuit of peace with too much passion uh, produced the opposite. Fascinating, David? I want to continue on that vein, Martin. You uh, have some marvelous uh, display quotes from that first book of Kissinger's, A World is, uh, Restored, uh, highlighting his admiration for the wily, manipulative Count Metternich. Um, but taking him by his own um, measure of what he was seeking, namely order, which is what Metternich and uh, Congress of Vienna created, how would you um, rate him, not as a peacemaker, because as you said, that wasn't really what it was about, but as an order maker? So the order that Kissinger created did not last for 100 years, like, like the order that Metternich and Tassere created, but it lasted for about 30, 30 years. And, and uh, he, you know, it, it, it's for me, it's fascinating because he took the model of order created after the Napoleonic Wars in 19th century Europe as a template and applied it to the Middle East. Now, you know, a classic Orientalist kind of approach, right? Imagine that what, what was good for Europe should be good for the Middle East. And yet it worked. Why? Because Metternich and Castlereagh's genius, to the extent it was genius, was to take post-Napoleonic France and make it a status quo power committed to maintaining order. And that's what Kissinger did with Egypt. He was given a massive assist by Sadat, who was ready for that, who wanted peace, who wanted to turn from the Soviet Union to the United States. So flipping Egypt from being a revolutionary power that went to war to a status quo power committed to peace was, was relatively easy. But that was the genius of Kissinger's strategy because taking Egypt out of the conflict with Israel then made it impossible for any of the other Arab states to go back to war. He effectively ended the state-to-state -state conflict. Of course, there have been lots of other conflicts since, but not a state-to-state Arab-Israeli conflict since. And he understood that in order for that to succeed, he had to get Syria involved to legitimize Sadat's move, the Egyptian move. And so he spent an inordinate amount of time, 30 days on the road back and forth between Jerusalem and Damascus to get the Syrians uh, to get their hands dirty, as it were, with making an agreement with Israel. And, and those two factors uh, stabilized the order, as I say, for around 30 years and stabilized the Golan Heights, by the way, right up until the present, more or less, even with the disintegration of, uh, of Syria into civil war. Uh, so and on that scale, he did very well. And, and when it broke down, it broke down because we who came after Kissinger knew not Kissinger. And, and I, what I mean by that is Kissinger's approach was not a naturally American approach to the world. But he was very much aware of that. He was very much aware that, that you know, when American leaders came to the Middle East, they'd want to 
make peace. They want to go for the Holy Grail. They want the Nobel Peace Prize. And, and he was right about that. He was cautioning about it, but we, we didn't hear him. He, let's say he wasn't cautioning loud enough, or as you know, after, after he left office, people tended to, to uh, distance themselves from Kissinger and, and uh, criticize him rather than adopt his approach. So, so I think that, that he can't be blamed in the end for the breakdown of, of the order uh, any more than you can blame Castle Ray and Metternich for, for the First World War. I ask one follow-up question that turn this back to, to, to Chris. And that, that is to ask you, Martin, to talk a little bit about the uh, X factor, if you will, of Kissinger's uh, manipulative, um, often quite funny uh, personal style, which comes through in these pages. There's one thing that just made me made me laugh out loud reading it. Um, it's a scene where, where Kissinger's talking with Hafez al-Assad and Assad uh, says what he wants to tell the Soviet foreign minister at the time, Andre Gromyko, uh, and Kissinger shakes his head and says, no, keep it confused. And you write, Assad laughed and said he would be guided by Kissinger since he was an expert at that. And there, there is this way in which these characters in the Middle East recognized uh, one of their own, a fellow, a fellow scoundrel. And that, that was part of his um, unusual ability. Could you talk about that, as I say, the X yeah. factor of his personality? Yeah, uh, for sure. And uh, I think it's a very good point. Um, that, that what, what Assad was referring to was Kissinger's preference for obfuscation. Even to this day, when you go and have a conversation with Henry, you come out of it kind of scratching your head, saying, what do, they, what do we mean by that? Uh, he became an expert in that. I actually have a theory about that, um, which is that he was operating in an environment in Washington, essentially an anti-Semitic president and, and, and a White House that, that looked admired his brilliance, but looked at him with, with suspicion. And, and uh, a State Department that he basically regarded as hostile territory, he was constantly trying to screw the Secretary of State, Will Rogers. So, you know, he, he, he had to operate in disguise, as it were, and disguise what he was really up to. And I, I detailed some of those things. So yes, it's a good point, David, in saying that he was, he was uh, quite Middle Eastern, in his approach. Uh, and that worked well in the sense that, that they kind of enjoyed the engagement with him. But I'm not sure that he was fully aware uh, that they knew him. They knew, you know, they knew <laughs> what he was up to, uh, or at least suspected. And so uh, part of the beauty of this interaction was it was difficult to know at any particular time who was Zooming whom in Aretha Franklin's marvelous term that applies so much today, uh, because they were all playing games with him, knowing that he was playing games with them. And, and you know, there are some amazing uh, results. Rubian for sure knew exactly what Kissinger was up to uh, because he had worked with him in Washington. And Rubian was a bit of a straight shooter. He, he didn't like it. Uh, but Assad, you know, just just lapped it up and, and played with him and he played with Assad in the same way. And <laughs> the, the, this amazing uh, situation in which Sadat had in his office his uh, one of his closest advisors, his, his chef de cabinet, was Israel's highest placed spy in the Arab world. And this guy, Ashraf Marwan, was <laughs> reporting to the Israelis on all the conversations that Kissinger was having with Sadat. So they had an independent means of, uh, of checking on him. Of course, Marwan wasn't in the room. Sadat would come out and give him whatever story he wanted to give him. So the Israelis would all get worked up and Kissinger would never understand why he had constantly had to kind of bring Golda down from the ceiling because of what she'd heard 
from, from their key spy. And as far as I can tell, Kissinger wasn't aware of it. He obfuscated when I asked him the question, whether he knew about it. So yeah, it was really, everybody was manipulating everybody else. And that's part of the beauty of, of the diplomatic engagement. You know, Martin, in the title of your book, obviously you referred to master of the game. Could you talk a little bit about how Kissinger and you view the game then? What is the game? Did the game change when you were there? Is it a new mm. game today? So the game is in, in the first instance, it's a, it's a game of diplomacy. Um, anybody who's played the board game diplomacy uh, will get a, get a feeling for the, the kinds of things that go on there. The lying manipulation, the, the uh, betrayals, um, et cetera. So uh, the way that I really define the game is the, the challenge of moving leaders to places they would rather not go. And that's what Kissinger was the master of. Uh, in, this, in, you know, in this case, he was moving them towards peace. And, and there the irony is that Sadat was always one step ahead of him. And it was Kissinger who was actually going slow. But in the case of the Israelis, and I, I detail this in the book, he had to persuade them uh, through the power of his argument, assisted at times by pressure of withholding arms, for example. Uh, but it was essentially an argument that he had with them. And it, it was like knockdown, drag out fights in which he would summon all of his charm, celebrity status, Jewishness, um, and the power of his argument to eventually uh, persuade them that they had to give up territory for uh, Israel's long-term benefit. And, and when you look at the situation today and the difficulty, uh, almost impossibility of getting Israel to, to give up territory now, um, you see it, it, was a, it was a Herculean challenge and he was definitely master of that game. David? So this is probably a good time to remind people that they can buy the book uh, online by going down to the uh, chat uh, and uh, ordering it. Martin, um, you in researching the book had uh, an unusual, I wanna say unique opportunity to interact with Kissinger. Uh, through your own relationship because of Gail's long relationship. And I think we'd all be fascinated to hear a little bit, bit about uh, how, how interesting and complicated that was. If you feel you can share some of Kissinger's reactions to you along the way uh, as you tried to check facts, I think that would be uh, especially interesting for, for folks. I had known um, Kissinger before uh, I met Gail. Um, when I uh, uh, moved into the White House as uh, President Clinton's Middle East advisor, I sought him out and, and uh, we started a dialogue conversation then. Uh, it was serendipitous that I, that I subsequently met, met Gail. Uh, but uh, the relationship uh, developed in a, in a surprising way. Um, and I came to understand Kissinger as, as a sentimentalist, um, which I don't think is commonly understood about him. Uh, he, he, uh, he was deeply sentimental about our relationship. And, and um, you know, when I uh, went through my uh, struggles with cancer, he would call every other week uh, to find out how I was. Um, and, and to this day, he, he continues to be concerned about my health. This is a 98 year old, you know, <laughs> he'd be concerned more about his own health. So uh, there was that side to it, which of course made it complicated to, to uh, write the book. Um, because, uh, you know, if, if I wrote a hagiography, it would be, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it today. Uh, nobody would be, be interested in it. 
And, and you know, <laughs> I gave him two chapters to read in draft form, uh, which uh, were, I thought, the best chapters for him, the least critical of him. And uh, he, he spent a week reading it. He called Gail afterwards and said, I never want to talk to your husband again. Uh, so <laughs> I was in the, in the doghouse. But, but eventually he kind of uh, relented. Walter Isaacson can tell you, he, he kept Walter after Walter wrote an excellent biography, the first one of, of Henry, kept Walter in the doghouse for 30 years or something. Uh, but uh, for me, it was about three months. Uh, event, you know, he, he then became very uh, tetchy about it, very concerned about it and, and, and um, you know, called me and would complain about when I would ask for permission, complain about what I wanted to quote him on and so on. Finally, I said to him, you know, Henry, you, I think you'll like the title of the book. And he said, what's that? I said, Master of the Game. Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. And there was this long pause. Finally, he says, well, I can't argue with that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he finally, when he actually read the whole book, I think he was, he was pleased. I know he was pleased because he said to me, he was pleased that, that somebody would have spent so much time, you know, detailing uh, his, his, efforts and um, that that was unusual for him and he was grateful for that he was also also grateful we can talk about this about what i i uh, said at subtext of the book about his relationship with as the first jewish secretary of state with the jewish state of israel what he didn't like was the the manipulation that i revealed all the 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 various tactics that he used the and I, I uh, meant that as a compliment to him. I thought he'd be, you know, because that's the, the art of diplomacy is manipulation uh, in one way or another. But, but uh, he, he was worried that he, that, that he would come out of it looking bad. I don't, I don't think that's the case, but that, that's his main concern. Just uh, one more question from me, Martin, and then we'll turn it back to Chris and the questions from the audience, uh, this book is about the period of American dominance in the Middle East. And we're now living in a period of uh, the eclipse of American power in the Middle East, uh, maybe retreat, hard to know. But I'd be very interested in your um, explanation of how we got from there, the, the Kissinger years to now, in particular, whether this story would have been fundamentally different if we hadn't invaded Iraq in 2003. And the final point, uh, whether you think it's gonna make uh, a significant negative difference for the, United, for the United States to be less involved uh, in the Middle East as peacemaker, uh, hegemon, guarantor. Well, it's a big, big question. Um, I'll try to give a short answer. Um, you know, the, I said uh, before that the, the order that Kissinger succeeded in creating, an American-led and American-dominated order in the Middle East, uh, lasted for about 30 years. It first started to come apart in the Clinton administration, where I was responsible in one way or another for Middle East policy. And, and it, you know, part of the reason for that was the breakdown of the peace process. For Kissinger, the peace process was his mechanism for legitimizing the order. And, and we, uh, at the end of 2000, as you re recall, uh, did something that Kissinger would have opposed. We succumbed to Ehud Barak's uh, insistence that we go to Camp David and resolve the conflict in a, a conflict ending summit. Uh, Kissinger never believed such a thing was possible, or at least if it was possible, it would take a very long time. And yet we went off to Camp David to try to do that. Uh, Arafat didn't wanna go. Arafat said to us he wasn't ready for such a, a negotiation, but Barack insisted and we insisted. And, 
and it blew up in our faces. And and that uh, had a you know had a real impact on America's credibility in the region. It destabilized the heartland. It broke up the whole normalization process uh, that that started with the Oslo Accords with the other Arab states and was interrupted until now. Yusuf, uh, who's I think here, um, had the breakthrough of uh, the normalization with, with the UAE. That's a, that's a long time in, in the waiting. Um, and, and then after that, we had a kind of cascade of events. The most important one was the one you referred to, which is uh, George W. Bush's uh, decision to invade uh, uh, Iraq and, and topple Saddam Hussein. And again, Kissinger didn't, didn't believe in regime change, didn't believe in toppling leaders. You contained them, you deterred them, uh, but you didn't go in and try to um, topple them. And, and uh, of course, we opened the gates of Babylon to the Iranians in the process. And, and they took advantage of that as a revolutionary power uh, to uh, assert their own effort at, at uh, dominance in, in the region. Uh, and, and then came the Arab Spring, as you know. And, and we took a, a pillar of, our, of, of Kissinger's uh, stable order, which was Egypt, which was the core, the anchor of Kissinger's order. And we told Mubarak he had to go. When Hillary Clinton tried to have, if you remember, an orderly departure, the word was, was appropriate, an orderly departure, the White House undermined her completely and, and, and told Mubarak he had to leave yesterday. And that you know, combination of all of those factors, no peace process, um, Iran coming into the Middle East heartland via, via uh, our efforts in Iraq, and then taking apart the order by, by promoting regime change, not just in Egypt, but Libya, Syria, and so on. We really um, did a lot to destroy the American-led order that, that Kissinger had done so much to build. Uh, and there's, a, I think, a very important lesson in all of that about the dangers of overreaching everywhere, but particularly in the Middle East. Kissinger erred on the side of underreaching, if I could call it that, of aiming too long. And he missed opportunities to head off the war and and, and to make peace. But um, the overreaching that, that came from subsequent administrations, the Republican and Democrat alike, uh, really uh, uh, ended up having a, you know, just a devastating impact on the region, on stability in the region, and on our own standing in the region. Now, because you asked, well, what happens now? We have to go back to some Kissingerian principles. We have to attend to the balance of power. If we ignore it in the Middle East, as you'll be the first to say, it'll come back and force us to come back in. You can already see it with Iran as it moves to the threshold of nuclear capability. We're gonna to have to pay attention to that. We're gonna to have to contain and deter Iran. We're gonna to have to stabilize the order, not as an American led order, but as an American supported order with Israel and the Sunni Arab states uh, working together to, to stabilize the situation. Uh, and, and we have to have, again, a, a peace process, an incremental, gradual effort to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian problem, because I'm afraid that within a year, it's going to blow again. And it'll just be like Sadat before the 1973 war. We ignored him. Kissinger thought he could stabilize it without taking care of Arab grievances. And it all blew up in his face. And I'm afraid it'll blow up in our faces again too. We're already getting some wonderful questions. Please do you know, text me on the chat or raise your hand. We'll try to get as many of them as we can. I'm gonna start with Michael Beschloss, please. Oh, thanks, Chris. By the way, our son Cyrus says, uh, please say hello to Jack. Send back. That's wonderful. Okay, got a deal. Uh, 
thank you guys for doing this. Uh, thank you, Martin, for the great book, which people in my line of work will be using, I'm sure, for the next 50 years plus. Thank you. Uh, here's my question. Uh, when I began to read, I couldn't help but remember the fact that, as you know so well, during the Six Day War, President Johnson felt that it was so dangerous to have a Jewish person with any connection to the policy of the United States during the Six Day War that his national security advisor, Walt Rostow, who was not exactly the most religious or practicing person on earth anyway, but basically Rostow was told to sit in the corner, as you know, for basically that month. And Johnson brought in to substitute for him, Mac Bundy, who I always figured the way Johnson's mind worked, he was looking for the most non-Jewish person he knew, came up with Bundy and flew him in uh, to take care of policy during that time so he wouldn't be criticized. So my question is, you talked a little bit about it this morning, and I know you go into it in the book, and I know that you've got ideas about this because we've talked about it a little bit over the years. Uh, I know you're not a psychobiographer, but how did it affect Kissinger in dealing with Israel and the rest of the Middle East to have had so many members of his family die in the Holocaust, to have escaped Nazi Germany himself, and his, I would say, paradoxical feelings about that background, both just psychiatrically and also knowing, as people have mentioned, that he was dealing with the Nixon White House and H.R. Haldeman was not exactly the most pro-Semitic person I've ever run into in history, nor was Nixon, nor were, you know, Kissinger talks about the anti-Semitic atmosphere so that's something that was very evident. So my question is, psychologically, how much was he affected in dealing with the issue? And in terms of his room for movement politically, you talk about the fact, which is very persuasive, the fact that he, if anything, he can be criticized for lack of ambition in trying to transform the Middle East and try to correct the problem if it was possible in a fundamental way. How much is this a different story from the one, you know, let's say that William Rogers had been Nixon's secre uh, national security advisor during these years, uh, obviously different background, all sorts of different issues. So if you take the Jewish part of this, how does that affect Kissinger, both in the way he thought and behaved? Yeah, thank you, Michael. And and the Rostow story is fascinating, and and I'm ashamed to say that I wasn't aware of it, uh, wow. and I'm very glad to know it. Um, that, that was because, just 18 months before Kissinger came in. Right, right. Well, it's fascinating because Kissinger, uh, from the get-go, Nixon told him, "You have to stay away from the Middle East because you're Jewish." Right. Uh, and and. Uh, that's going to be Rogers and the State Department. In a way that uh, uh, American diplomats of Anglo descent were not kept away from dealing with Britain. <laughs> Indeed. But no Jews were appointed to the post of ambassador to Israel right. until until my appointment in the Clinton administration. I was I the first Jew. Well. And that American was a Jewish matter of controversy as late as 93, right? Indeed. And there were many... State Department Foreign Service officers, Jewish ones who did not want to uh, become ambassador to Israel because right. of that, that standard. But Kissinger, I think, resented it deeply, uh, partly because you know he 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 uh, felt that the Middle East he should not be excluded from the Middle East. You know, it was like uh, it was part of his world. But uh, he had never really paid any attention to the Arab world uh, before he uh, moved into government. He had never uh, visited the Arab world. He'd visited Israel six times before he, he uh, joined the Nixon administration. Uh, and, you know, his background, as I say, was not only that he fled Nazi Germany, but he had an Orthodox Jewish upbringing um, and had lived in an Orthodox, with an Orthodox family environment and married an Orthodox Jewess. And, and uh, that was his world. Uh, he left it during the Second World War and he gave up his practice of the Jewish religion, but he never uh, gave up his Jewish identity and never, never tried, never denied it. Uh, um, he, he was always, I wouldn't say he was a proud Jew, 
but he, he definitely saw his Jewishness as part of his identity. And he identified with Israel for that reason and cared about its survival. And I have a whole um, lot of evidence to, to demonstrate that. Uh, when he came into office, he acted in all sorts of ways to try to help Israel, including the way that he designed the peace process to make it acceptable to Israel. He was in many ways saving Israel in spite of itself. Um, and, and his success at bringing them around uh, was hugely important to the Israel we see today, to its strength and its standing in, in the international community and its relations with its Arab neighbors. Uh, so, you know, in terms of psychoanalysis, he, he understood that he was operating in an anti-Semitic environment. A lot of the things that he did um, that, that we rightly regard as, as questionable and, and dubious, including, you know, going along with the wiretapping of his Jewish aides and his Jewish friends in the, in the media, uh, was all part of the way that he, you know, he was operating in this environment. And he wanted to show that he was one of the boys and those egregious statements he made, I see in, in that context. Um, but underneath it all, he was operating according to his own uh, North Star. And that was, I say, creating order, but ensuring when it came to Israel that Israel had a role in the order that he was creating. That, that Israel's uh, survival and, and well-being was part and parcel of the order that he was trying to create. And I show in detail how he did that. That is very contrary to the image that he has in the Jewish community and in much of Israel, where he's seen to have you know, withheld arms during the 1973 war, when Israel's moment of greatest need, where he, he um, is believed to have, you know, been stolen uh, Israel's victory away from it by forcing them to give up its strang their stranglehold on the Egyptian Third Army and you know, pressuring it to give up territory, uh, strategic passes and oil fields in Sinai, for example. So he's, he's, he's got a bad rap generally, I would say. And I think unfairly um, because people didn't understand what he was actually doing. And I document the ways in which he, he helped Israel, fairly dramatic ways in which he helped Israel. Uh, but it wasn't just that, that uh, people didn't see what he was doing, it's that he didn't want to broadcast what he was doing. I think even to this day, he doesn't feel comfortable. I don't think I know to this day, he does not feel comfortable about talking about it. Um, and I think that's a product of the way in which he was functioning in those uh, White House years. Aaron, we have a question from Israel from Gideon Argoff, whose family, of course, you know um, um, in the history there. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, his microphone isn't working, so he asked me if I could post. It's hard to speculate on this, but I bet you have some sense on his question, which is, if, if Kissinger were in charge today or played the role that he played then now, would he be, how would he be advocating the U.S. to contain the Iranian nuclear threat and contain any potential Israeli preemptive strike? Does that game still work for him in this environment? Look, it's, it's difficult for me to say. Uh, we have talked about it, um, but uh, it's a fast moving situation. Uh, I would say the following. Number one, uh, Kissinger regards Iran as a great regional power uh, with a, you know, uh, he has respect for its uh, long uh, history and civilization, Persian civilization. Uh, and so he hopes for a time when eventually the Iranian revolution will run its course and as he famously said, it, Iran will choose to be a country rather than a cause. In other words, when it will revert from being a revolutionary power to a more status quo power. And, and until that day happens, that day comes, his approach is standard approach, a balance of power approach, which is to balance Iran, to contain it and to deter it. 
uh, and that that would be his his general approach while being open to the possibility that there are things you could do to flip it to encourage that uh, choice of a country rather than a cause he would never go along with the idea of regime change in iran and and uh, you know that's that's doesn't fit within his approach to the world and to the states within it. Um, when it comes to, to Israel, uh, he's very aware of, of Israel's dilemma uh, in this regard. And, and um, you know, I think that, that his general approach to the whole issue of nuclear weapons, in which he's a real expert and has written a lot about, um, is one of deterrence. So I don't think uh, that, I, I, look, I don't think he would be opposed to a pre preventative strike uh, by Israel if it were to be effective. Um, you know, he, he, the, the idea that uh, Israel and the Arab states uh, allied to the United States should step up and take more responsibility uh, is something that he supports. The idea of an Israeli Sunni axis to counter Iran is something that he believes in. Um, but his mo main approach, I think, as, as Iran reaches the nuclear threshold would be one of deterrence, extending a nuclear umbrella to, to our allies in the region, including Israel, so that Israel would not need to take its bomb out of the basement, as it were, because that would even add more fuel to the to the nuclear arms race in the region uh, that that would come from Iran's nuclear ambitions. So, so I think that that you know it, 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 it's a fairly standard Kissingerian approach to the problem. From the U.S. point of view, um, it's it's uh, just a realist approach that you know we can live with countries with nuclear weapons. We live with North Korean nukes and Pakistani nukes. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, the United States can live with Iranian nukes. We just have to deter them and, and contain them. Um, but that's not an option that Israel, you know, very li living in the neighborhood um, with its unique vulnerabilities and its unique history can easily uh, live with. And I think he definitely recognizes the difference between the American interest here and the Israeli interest. Yaya Samawi. Yeah, thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Martin. And this is a, an amazing, amazing what I'm hearing. Actually, I just purchased a book because you humanized Kissinger for me. He was a person <laughs> when you see on TV was never, it was a machine, not the, not the, Interesting. Um, yeah. I have a, um, or questions, maybe and it's the opposite question to what Michael was asking. Um, first of all, he's the one who really initiated the peace processes and tried to get the Arab states with uh, to make peace with Israel. But the real peace that uh, happened is the one with the UAE where it's normalization like two normal countries would have with each other. Um, Jordan, <laughs> Jordan and um, and Egypt until today don't enjoy the uh, um, the brotherly love. If you if you're if you're a, you know a peaceful person, the brotherly love that the UAE has provided for Israelis and vice versa. Um, do you think that he feels like this is a failure for his peace process when you you would see what the UAE has done? Or oh, no, on the contrary, you see Kissinger's view was was that peace would come eventually with the stress on eventually, uh, and uh, that it would take time, uh, but the time could work in favor of peace. Time to enable Israel to reduce its isolation, uh, strengthen itself with American support, so that uh, when the Arabs over time exhausted themselves and came to terms with Israel, uh, that Israel would be in a position to make the kinds of withdrawals necessary to complete the peace 
uh, process that he had in mind. So, so you know, the idea that that forty years later, the uh, leaders of of uh, the Emirates, in their wisdom, would would decide finally to normalize with Israel, um, and in the process, note that they were tired of the conflict. Uh, was a kind of fulfillment of Kissinger's expectation. So I think he's, uh, he's, he feels vindicated by, by that. And, and just to pick up on, on your comment about Egypt and Jordan, what, what is fascinating to me about the dynamic that, that the UAE started here was that we're all kind of looking at who's the next one to normalize. And will Saudi Arabia normalize? But what we're missing is, uh, and this is so true of the Middle East, it's, all, you know, it's always unexpected the way it happens, that the Egyptians and Jordanians, who, as you said, Yaya, kept Israel at arm's length, despite their peace treaties, are now moving under the cover provided by the Abraham Accords, are now moving more actively to engage with Israel. And Egypt in particular, and there are other reasons for this as well that relate to uh, its relationship with the Biden administration, but Egypt is now moving into Gaza and, and taking a presence there and playing a mediatory role there and trying to basically become the custodian of Hamas in uh, Gaza, something it never been prepared to do before. And cooperating with Egypt in all manner of exercises. Now Jordan, has this this amazing agreement with Israel, where it's going to have solar farms uh, built and, and paid for by the UAE to provide energy, solar energy to Israel, and Israel is going to desalinate water and provide water to Jordan. It it's it's a, a an arrangement which is so obvious, and yet for twenty years the talk of of joint projects between Israel and Jordan went nowhere. And suddenly now with the cover of the Abraham Accords and the role of, of the UAE, we see these things become possible. And so uh, I think that that is the real uh, advantage of, of the Abraham Accords, or one of the unexpected but real advantages of the Abraham Accords is the way in which Egypt and Jordan have been given cover to warm up their relationship and I suspect Egypt and Jordan are also a little worried. They don't want to miss out. In, and they see the advantages of normalization that the UAE and Bahrain and the others are gaining. And they want to be part of that too. If I can just follow up. No, quickly. actually, Yahi, I have to apologize because we're sadly running out of time. We have two more very, and I'm going to ask you, Tevi, to take one to give a very quick question. And then I'm going to let David wrap in the end because I know he's got one final question. So, uh, Martin, I can't thank you enough, and Gail, and everyone who's been no, here. Oh, thanks to you. Tevi, if you could ask a, a relatively brief question, and then I'll ask David to wrap us, thanking all of you. Yeah, very briefly, and uh, congratulations on the book. I look forward to reading it. Uh, I just want to ask about something you touched on in terms of his relationship with Rogers. In my book, Fight House, I rank Kissinger as one of the, the greatest intergovernmental fighters, bureaucratic infighters. Uh, but I wonder, was it all necessary? Did he have to fight tooth and nail with Rogers to get done what he had to do? Wouldn't he have been better off kind of cooperating with Rogers on all of his initiatives, including in China, including the Middle East? Well, in a perfect world, yes. But, <laughs> but um, you know, it was, it, it was a structural conflict in the sense that there's always this tension. See, Steve Hadley, uh, here and can tell you in detail that there's a structural tension between the NSC and the State Department over coordination of policy versus implementation of policy. But because it's the White House, proximity of the president, the NSC inevitably gets involved in implementation issues as well. And that inevitably creates resentment uh, in the State Department. So it's, it's structural. Now, Nixon brings Kissinger in and tells him, look, don't worry about Rogers. We're going to go off and, 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 and do all these great things together, change the world. 
and you can just ignore Rogers. He's just going to do the Middle East and leave him alone with the Middle East. And, and Nixon encouraged Kissinger to set up all of these back channels, to go around the State Department. And as Kissinger says uh, very candidly in his memoirs, you know, Nixon, Nixon wanted me to do it, but I uh, have to say that I went along with it uh, with some, some enthusiasm. Uh, so, so it was a combination of things that created that great tension. So yes, it would have been better if they could all get on, but it, it's not uh, the nature of the game in Washington in general, and it's certainly not the nature of bureaucratic politics. And this was the most extreme form of it. It was partly to do with Kissinger. By the way, Rogers uh, was not prepared to cooperate. Uh, and Kissinger, on occasions when Kissinger tried, he was he was rebuffed. So it, you know, it wasn't all just in one direction, but it was it it was really epic, the battles that those two had, and it got to the point where Ki where Nixon couldn't handle it at all. Uh, he didn't like confrontation. He didn't like having to deal with with um, these two two prickly personalities. And uh, in the end, and by the way, Haldeman in his diaries details what went on here, if you, want to, if you want to see just how bad it got. In the end, he just kind of threw up his hand and said, all right, Henry, you can be Secretary of State as well. So he solved the problem by having Kissinger both as National Security Advisor and as Secretary of State. And that was the only way in which he could, in effect, remove the, the uh, rivalry. Um, and Kissinger didn't fight with himself too much. David, if you and dumping his old friend Rogers in the process. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> David, if you can bring us home. Yeah, so uh, I just want to end this really marvelous uh, discussion uh, by remembering, Martin, an evening when you came back from your uh, stint as special envoy uh, for John Kerry. It was a, a party outside at a, a house of some Washington friends of ours. And I remember you saying that you devoted your much of your adult life to this cause of peacemaking and that it had failed. Uh, it was a painful night. And I'm just wondering how you feel about that now. And if briefly in the time we have left, you could just sketch what you think the lessons of your own story, the Kissinger to Indic uh, arc, if you will, uh, are. Thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, and let me just say thank you to everybody uh, for joining in today. It's been a wonderful opportunity for me and I'm very grateful to you, David, and to Chris uh, for this idea and for pulling it off in such a, uh, a grand way. Um, so thank you sincerely. Uh, yes, uh, there's no doubt that, that um, I viewed my last go round, uh, which was my third effort to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as, as a failure and one that I felt an obligation to, to learn from. And that's where this book came from. Um, I decided that I needed to go back to a time when, we, when the United States had been successful in its peacemaking efforts and as, go back to where it all began with Henry Kissinger who, who was very successful and try to understand and learn how to and how not to make peace from, from the master of the games. Uh, for me, you know, that being involved in that particular negotiation, uh, the lesson that I came away from it with was really that, that it was hopeless, that the parties were further apart at the end of our negotiation than they were at the beginning. And, and the toxicity in the relationship between the Israelis and the Palestinians, the deep mistrust of Netanyahu and Abu Mazen for each other, and the deep mistrust of the Israeli people and the Palestinian people for each other, um, meant that you, you just had become a hopeless situation. And that was sad and, and very tragic. So I really hoped that by going back uh, to where it all began, I would would learn something uh, uh, that would be useful for the peacemakers of the future. And what I learned, and I did not expect this, uh, was that 
we needed to be a lot more careful, a lot more cautious. The real aha moment for me when the light bulb went off was in my last interview with Henry Kissinger, when I said to him, did you ever regret not making the peace between Israel and Egypt? Because the documentation shows that, that they were both ready and yet you didn't take advantage of that. And he said, no, if I had been reappointed as Secretary of State, if Ford had won rather than Carter, uh, I would have pursued a non-belligerency agreement, not a peace agreement. And so that why? He said, well, because I was always concerned that if I pushed too hard, I would break it. And for me, that, that was the real lesson. As I said before, at Camp David in 2000, we pushed too hard and we broke it. And, and four presidents since then have tried to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and all four presidents failed to do so. Now, it's not only that, you know, it was like Humpty Dumpty. Once we broke it, we couldn't put it back together again. And that was obvious from my own experience there that I related to you. But it was also that, that um, we needed to approach it differently. Ever since Kissinger, we've been trying to end the conflict. And maybe it's time now, not maybe, I think definitely it's time now to adopt a more gradual, incremental, step-by-step -step approach, which was the hallmark of Kissinger's diplomacy in the Middle East. And, and I think that, that we could move the Israelis and the Palestinians through a step-by-step -step process. The Israeli government is prepared to take steps now. They're not big enough steps and we need to be more active in. In, in getting them to do that. And they're not territorial steps. Kissinger's basic point about his peace process was it had to be lubricated by territorial withdrawals on Israel's part, small, gradual, but nevertheless, there had to be a territorial element. And that's an additional lesson about how to make peace um, in this environment. So that's a superb ending for just a, a discussion I think we'll all remember. Thank you so much, Barton, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all. you, David. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all. Thank you.